that is about that recording message. Uh, the scam is carried out by compromising the legitimate business email accounts through social engineering. Normally, that transpires through a phishing email that is being sent, and somebody within the organization clicks on a link. Or it could be a computer intrusion technique. All right, next. There we go. So there's a lot of different scams associated with business email compromises, and here there are several. So this could be the popular targets tend to be the third party payroll companies, real estate companies, realtors, title companies, firms that offer legal services. It could be a law firm. The expectation is that there's a lot of communication back and forth regarding payments. You can have a bogus invoice. Picture yourself sending, um, expecting an invoice from a vendor. And at some point, the communication has been intercepted and the email and the payment instructions have been modified. We also see the CEO fraud scam that is still transpiring. Someone is attacking the company's uh, CEO email group. Uh, it could be an executive and they send out an email to an employee asking for a payment. The payroll redirection. You can have an employee uh, email compromise where you receive an email and it's the employee is asking you to send their payroll or any of their information to somewhere else. Um, they've been the ones compromised and that's where the, e the payroll is being redirected. All right, next. So the real estate related email compromise has become very common. It's definitely very scary. Title companies, attorneys and lenders and any other related parties have been compromised. Cyber criminals will compromise the email account. They will study the activity on the account and impersonate a related party. This is no longer the case back in years ago where you would be able to identify misspellings on those emails and identify that something wasn't right. They will study the behavior for months. They will learn how people write. They will see the different methods of communication with the different parties so that they can mimic it and not have any red flags. So it's no longer something that's very obvious as it used to be. The main goal is to deceive a victim into originating a payment, especially a wire transfer. We see that with modified closing documents that are either presented via email with payment instructions or even via fax. There are some that are still sending it via fax. Um, they will send it whether they pretend to be the lender, the title company, and the buyer, or anyone in between. Next. So here are the red flags. For one, it is no longer the case where you may see that when you're reviewing an email address, it could be off by a letter, you can have an extra letter, but many of them, when it's a true email account takeover, it will be the exact email address. You can hover over it with your mouse and you can see when you kind of right click it, you'll be able to see if it actually belongs to another party or it's completely different. But in most cases, it's the actual email account. You may receive multiple sets of wire instructions, whether it be for a real estate deal or for a vendor, you are gonna all of a sudden you receive one wire instruction and it's a little bit different than where you would normally send your payments to. We do add the poor grammar because you still see them, but not as much. There will always be a sense of urgency. And it's a little unusual for the parties that you tend to communicate with. You may have communicated with them before, but they're really, really persistent because they don't want you to be contacted by someone else because they've identified that their emails were compromised. The seller contacts the title company with a payment instruction changes as opposed to the lender. So the person who's sending you the information is just not the normal party that would send it. Some of the other red flags is that the payee of whom you're sending the wire to is not a party associated with the transaction. The payee could be a law firm that's not even involved with the transaction. The beneficiary bank may not be a local bank. It may be a bank that you're not familiar with. The emails uh, may be sent outside the normal business hours, and that normally transpires when they're coming from a foreign country. These are little details that we don't tend to pay attention to when we're getting an email. But because of so many companies being compromised, I do encourage you to take a look at the time. The unexpected email with a link to a document is likely a link with malware. Thanks, Anna. And we're also seeing that there, you know, the email where it's coming from isn't necessarily changed anymore. It used to be where there was a, a letter or a number or something different about when you clicked on the sender's email address, they're actually getting the full, right? If they take over the email completely, it will look exactly like what the vendor's email is. Is that right? Oh, 
types of examples. Uh, an example of a typical business email, you have a customer who initiates a $250,000 wire to a beneficiary bank uh, to a lender. The proceeds are for a mortgage payoff. They are received by the mortgage lender. After a period of time, the customer is contacted by the lender, informing them of non-receipt of the loan payoff. The customer then contacts the bank 30 days later. I can imagine that that transpires when you're doing a payoff. You may not find out today. Indicating that they believe they were a victim of a fraud and request a wire recall. The beneficiary banks could not honor the wire recall because there were no longer funds in the beneficiary bank account. And the customer incurs the loss of $250,000. As you can see below is how the scam was actually executed. And it's transpiring by simply sending modified closing document via email or by fax. That, that has completely, it could have the, uh, the same beneficiary, but the bank information is going to change. And I think it's important for people to realize that even though the modified instructions are coming through by the name of the same party, that does not mean that the account at the other financial institution matches the beneficiary name. 99% of the time, it does not match. So you can kind of go through this scenario at a later time if you choose to do so. Here's another case scenario. It's not just about real estate. If your email account has been compromised, it is important to consider what the potential risks are. If the fraudster has obtained the account number and the online banking login credentials, they have compromised the customer's email account. If you change your password, as you can, you can if they've compromised your email account and someone goes in to access your bank account and they put in your user credentials, they can actually reset the password because the authentication method is going to be sent to the email. So if your email's been compromised, they're intercepting the bank's authorization code. Once the fraudster has access to your account, they can originate a payment and they now have the passcode that's sent to the email account. So there's a lot that can transpire. Many of us use our phones as a method of authentication, but our emails are extremely critical. How does this tend to happen? Shared credentials, uh, Microsoft Outlook dual authentication has been disabled. I think it's very important to enable. Uh, many take for granted that whenever there's an upgrade, it automatically defaults to dual authentication. I think it's important to ensure that you always have that dual authentication enabled. Uh, malware, phishing, phishing tends to be the primary method of compromise. Uh, dual control is not really dual control. Many companies, when they're processing a payment, you have two parties for security reasons. But sometimes you have that second person that just clicks because they want to proceed and they don't consider what the potential risks are. And I think it's important for both parties to really make sure that they're authenticating. And lack security tends to be one of the primary reasons of a compromise. Here's another case study, and I'll leave that for you for later. But I think it's important to see the different scenarios that transpire um, in that real estate world as because of the fact that the emails have been compromised. So this is a good case that we put on there. Okay, what to do if and when a business email compromise occurs. Many are gonna tell you contact law enforcement. The first thing that should be done is contact your financial institution. Uh, have a business continuity plan. There is a possibility of anybody falling victim. Have a plan of what happens. What happens if I'm a victim of a business email compromise? And you'll see later on in the rest of the presentation is what do I do if I'm a victim of any type of fraud? So here I mentioned contact your banking team immediately via telephone and email and know who you're to contact. I think that when some, a business has a uh, bank account, they should know who their account officer is have multiple parties contact information, their emails, their phone numbers, because the bank is going to be the first person, that that person is going to be the first party that we're going to be contacting. Ensure that all employees have the bank contact information. Inform the banking team of the fraudulent transaction and have sufficient details to relay what transpired. The reason why that is so important is that when the, when the fraud investigations team is working a case and they're going to try to help you recover the wire, they need to know the reason. Uh, there are, the way that banks communicate with each other is through messages. So they're gonna need to be able to state, our customer is a victim of a business email compromise, we're requesting a wire recall. So the details that are being sent to the other financial institution are going to determine how fast they're gonna respond. Provide a screenshot of the outbound wire so that all of the details are available to that account officer at the bank. Once informed, 
the bank team is going to alert the corporate fraud division. So I'm as far as Bank United is concerned, that is the method. And you would expect that method through any of the other uh, banks as far as their fraud teams are concerned. Request that a wire recall be submitted. Banks should submit a wire recall on the customer's behalf to the beneficiary bank with a message that specifically indicates that they've been a victim of a BEC. This is the method to facilitate recovery. Uh, it's important to gather all the relevant information that's associated with a business deal to provide the, the team, the fraud team from that specific financial institution with all of the information they need. The next guidance will be to complete an online FBI IC3. It's an internal internet complaint form or contact the FBI directly um, immediately, but contact them from your local area. I still say to contact first the financial institution, depending on where you have a, your bank account, the fraud team should be advising you of who to contact. You may file a police report with your local police department. If and when the bank successfully recovers funds, funds will be returned to the originating account. Keep in mind that a wire is not reversible. So what the financial institution does is help facilitate recovery. And normally a fraud investigator at a financial institution, at least specifically at Bank United, the first thing they're gonna do after that wire recall is reach out to fraud investigators at the beneficiary bank, hoping that they can hold the money so that we can go ahead and recover on behalf of the customer and the victim. The defense against a business email compromise. I know that I'm giving quite a bit of examples, but honestly, the number one uh, way to, to, to avoid this is for one, making sure that you're not clicking on any phishing emails. But honestly, if there's gonna be a payment that's going out, it's ensuring that every commercial client or any party, whenever you receive any type of payment instructions, you conduct a callback. That is the key. Every single business email compromise resulting and monies going out the door could have been prevented. Every single one could have been prevented by simply conducting a callback. So there's a lot of different things and examples that we put here. You see how I highlight the conducting a callback because it's definitely the number one. I think it's important to read the different things that transpire. Uh, businesses are encouraged to enhance their employee fraud awareness about all types of fraud, but here specifically we're discussing the business emails. Scrutinize every email. A lot of times the phishing transpires by an employee receiving an unsolicited email with a link specifically. Like there's no reason why this party is sending you that communication. Um, encourage employees to only use the business computers for business use. There's gonna be a section at the end where we put a lot of things to prevent any type of fraud. But I think it's very important um, that businesses discuss this with their own employees. Employees should not be accessing their own personal emails, any type of social media on the business computers. It just exposes you to a lot of unnecessary risk. I think one of the, the best examples is, I don't know about all of you, but on my personal emails, I think one out of a million is actually a good email. The rest of it is all spam. So you kind of struggle on, on email accounts. Many actually open a separate email um, account just for critical information, and they don't disclose that anywhere except critical parties because there's just so much spam. So imagine an employee accessing their personal emails on the business computer. Any one of those emails is a potential risk. And of course, I added on the bottom of obtaining cyber fraud insurance coverage, which I'm, you know, I know uh, Cheryl's gonna elaborate a little bit further, but we tell every single company should have some cyber fraud insurance coverage because anything can transpire. Here are the different types of scam. The tech support scam has become more common with those that are working remotely. So a victim may receive a little pop-up or even a phone call from someone saying that they work for the company and they need to do an upgrade or there has been an issue identified with the computer and then they ask them to provide remote access. That's it, that's like the real takeover right there. And many, since they're working remote, they will believe it. So I think it's very important for every company to understand and know that nobody from your IT department should be contacting you and asking you to, uh, to go, and this is an unsolicited. So if you're having problems with your computer and you're speaking to your employer and you're speaking to an actual employee, that's completely different than having some unsolicited message popping up or a phone call. Phishing and smishing is extremely common. These are scammers that are sending you an email or a text message asking you to click or download an attachment. At this point, I don't even uh, trust when I get a message from UPS that tells me click here or track your 
your Amazon payment. At this point, it is so scary that it's better just to go directly onto the site than to click anything on your phone or anything on your emails. Business scams, business is solicited by a scammer via email. Requesting a, birth, a business service with the intent to commit fraud. The scammer may send a counterfeit check in the mail, followed by instructions for the business to submit funds via wire after deducting fees. Real estate scams. I wanted to cover the deed fraud property uh, title fraud. Criminals are using false identification, claiming to be the owner of a property that is for sale. The title company is provided with all required documents, including payment instructions, and they'll send the payment to the fraudster. Thereafter, it is found that the property was never even listed for sale by the true owner. This is definitely transpiring a great deal, especially in South Florida and in Texas, uh, and it normally tends to involve vacant land. The red flags, the address of the property, the property owners and the notary tend to be located in different states. The notary is in a completely different state than property owners. And I think it's important for everyone to know that there are different laws in different states for a notary, especially if they're doing it virtual. So I think it's important to become familiar if that notary is located in New York or is located in Illinois to take a look at what their requirements are. Uh, payment beneficiary is not in the name of the property owner. I know some will say, well, you know, I sold my property and I want to send them my money to my child. I think it's important to really inquire when that beneficiary is not associated with any one of that property. The seller contacts the buyer via email without contacting a realtor. Some of this is not usual. Their owner only uses passport card. This is definitely something that we're seeing a lot of, and that's counterfeit passport cards as a form of identification. There's several things to help prevent and detect. Uh, enhanced a statement of identity. Questions only that the true owner of the property would know. You also have yearly ID checking guides. I had 2022, but every year they tend to modify it. Some they don't, US and Canada. Utilize um, ID verification services. There is many out there. We leverage LexisNexis, but there are many out there that can help you uh, provide a little bit of more information on the property owner. Contact the property owner directly using verified phone numbers. Sometimes this, this information is public record, so I encourage you to contact those specific property owners. And this is for deed fraud skin. Real estate check return. Um, these are different scenarios. I don't think it matters what type of business it is. But here what we're seeing in the real estate is the buyer's interested in purchasing a property and mails a check to the title company. Once the item is received and deposited by the title company, the buyer notifies the title company that they changed their minds. Then they request the return of funds. And that's what's happening. Normally those checks are coming through. And if you look at the maker, the maker has nothing to do with that deal, but they're also can mail it into the financial institution as well. Next thing you know, the title company is sending a wire transfer using the payment instructions that were provided. And then later the check returns as a counterfeit item or an altered item. It can take 48 to 72 hours before that check is returned. So it's gonna happen way too quickly. I encourage everyone to place a hold on those funds, maybe create a policy that if you're receiving a check and they change their mind, you're not gonna return the funds until 30 days, or you're not gonna return the funds until you know 10 business days, something that's gonna delay the process so that you're notified quickly of a return. The red flag is like I mentioned, the maker's name does not match the buyer's name. The payment information where the return of funds has no association to the buyer. The request to cancel is within 72 hours of the check being deposited. In situations like this, when you start really analyzing the fraud case, there are plenty of red flags. So conduct a thorough verification on all parties and allow for, like I mentioned, at least 10 business days for that check to be returned or you can choose to not accept checks. This is one of the examples that I mentioned of the business check return scam. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a real estate company. It happens to attorneys. It can happen to anyone. They're simply unsolicited emails that are coming through. Here we have ransomware. This is definitely um, a malicious software that's designed to block access to a computer system. The main targets, it could be um, human and technical weaknesses in an organization. And we don't necessarily know in many scenarios, this may be often something that you see on the news. It's, it could be mainly for money or it could be for other specific purposes. And it normally transpires by a phishing email or someone visiting infected websites. It can shut down your business. Malware, 
many of you may hear of malware and it can happen in, in any specific uh, form. Signs of malware would be that your computer is slowing down or it's locking up. Uh, you start seeing rebooting unexpectedly. I think all of us should be taking a look at what we're seeing as applications on our computers to identify if there's anything that's unusual. Uh, online banking. If you're logging into your bank account and it's re it repeats the prompts for IDs and passwords, or the elements of the page look a little bit different than what you're used to. Uh, what if? If you experience any of these signs, stop and call your bank immediately. Do not attempt to sign on to your banking site. The whole purpose of this malware is to infect your device and steal information, especially credentials. Check broad. So I listed here a variety of different types of check fraud because many don't realize that there is a different type of check fraud. This an honest check is basically the check that you write that is being paid against your account. And the different types of check fraud would be a counterfeit check, which is a fake check, an altered check, anything could be modified. It could be the dollar amount. It could be the payee. It could even be a trace of the signature. And then you have forgery, which is the maker's signature has been forged. A uh, forged missing endorsement, we are seeing quite a bit of those. Forged missing endorsement is that you, you made a check payable to anybody. You made it payable to Discover and somebody else intercepted that check and forged the endorsement or you don't even see an endorsement. Check fraud deposit is a different type of check fraud. So somebody gives you a check and it's a fake check or an altered check. It can literally be a completely fictitious check. The maker doesn't even exist. And then you receive it. So the, we're, we're looking at a mail theft epidemic at this point, and a mail theft epidemic has resulted in a check fraud epidemic. This is impacting every single state everywhere. We're seeing it all over the news. You're seeing it on LinkedIn. Uh, postal inspectors, which are not, we don't have enough postal inspectors, are constantly investigating these cases. Law enforcement is bombarded with these type of cases. And normally what's transpiring is a customer mails out a check and that check is intercepted by an unauthorized party and is negotiated and paid against the account. So what many are not understanding is that even if you mail a check out to a specific payee, many financial institutions are not validating the payee name against the account name. So especially if, a, if somebody is depositing that check via online banking, via mobile deposit, and they're not confirming it. So if the check is made out to John Doe, and you suddenly see that there's an endorsement situation doesn't mean that that bank actually looked at the payee and that is impacting many. Customers account information has been compromised and many times it will result in counterfeit checks. I think it's important to understand that the minute a check is intercepted, we're seeing those checks being sold in the dark web within 24 hours. It's very, very quick. So your payee may not have even yet notified you that they never received the check. So here are several things of preventing fraud, and I think there's quite a bit of them. So one of the things that I definitely would say is that any commercial client should obtain the fraud prevention services of positive pay payee or ACH fraud control in their financial institution. We offer it here at Bank United, and I know that financial institutions offer it. I really feel that any commercial client that does not have that service is really going to expose themselves to a lot of unnecessary risk. The cost is not that much. And I think it's definitely something that they should have. Uh, employee awareness is also number one. Every single employee should be aware of the different types of fraud that could potentially impact the business. It can literally shut down your business. Conduct dual control on wires, conduct callbacks. Uh, these are the main things. And obviously, I'm going to keep pushing for cyber insurance because there's only so much that a financial institution can do. A fraud investigator can do everything they can to try to help facilitate recovery. But if the money is gone on the other end, there will be no recovery, especially for a wire or an ACH. So for that, you should leverage having enough protection, just like we all need protection for our homes. We need protection for our cars. Everyone should have protection for their businesses. That includes cyber fraud. And I think there was two pages that we wanted to put in there, but I think it's really important that everyone uh, really review the fraud prevention things because there's a lot that you can do to not fall victim. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of information in there. And certainly here at Bank United, we do always offer payee positive pay, ACH debit blockers. 
Um, even if you're using a third party payable solution, right? Making sure that payee positive pay is part of that solution is really important. So obviously in the HOA industry, we have lots of different um, ways to make payments. I know there's board members that like to approve payments before they go out. Um, but as Anna said, I think learning to do callbacks, right? Whenever you're sending money out, we're seeing a lot of, hey, I have a new direct deposit, right? I'm an employee and I want my paycheck sent to a new place. So making sure that there's a callback to a number on file every single time you're sending a payment to a new payment method. Um, obviously, we have multi-factor authentication for our online banking, and we can also set up templates, right, which help kind of minimize some of those callbacks, right? Once a template is approved, whether it be an ACH or a wire, it's a little easier to have confidence, right, to know that that's an okay payment and that destination is secure. Um, but, you know, as, as banking has given, you know, banks and institutions have given you the tool to do things online and from your phone, it's wonderful. Um, but it used to be that the bank did all of that, right? The bank was always verifying and doing callbacks with the client. And now it's really on the client to do that with their vendors um, to make sure that it's, it's accurate. So thank you so much for that, Anna. I want to add, because I think it's really important, is that uh, wires and ACH are not reversible. So all we do, the financial institution is going to do is to try to facilitate recovery. And many think that when there's a victim, because any of us can fall victim with our accounts, is that a financial institution is responsible for issuing credit. And that's not how it is. Liability only falls on a signature. So if an altered item processes to account, the bank is not liable. But in every single fraud scenario, they will help facilitate recovery. They will work cases and try to help your victims, but financial institutions are not liable for every type of fraud that transpires on an account. And there's also time limits, right, Anna? So obviously, every, some people don't know, wire transfers, ACHs, and checks are three completely different payment channels that come with different rules and regulations, right? And there's a, there's a timeline there, right? So whether it's from statement cutoff, um, there is a time period and an expiration period, if you will, for banks to even be able to help with recovery. Okay. All right, with that, I will pass it over to Cheryl. Um, obviously, first things first, make sure you have all these tools in place. And now Cheryl is for the, you know, the God forbid factor. They get through all of these things that you've done in your organization and somehow the payment does get out um, and you do unfortunately take a loss. Cheryl's gonna talk through the different policies and procedures that you should have in place. Um, hold on, let's see. Is this you, Cheryl? Yeah. Yep, that's me. Okay. Yes, and Anna mentioned numerous ways that these cyber criminals are finding back doors and, uh, you know, they're able to get away with things that we never thought were imaginable. And we've found over the last few years, cyber is just evolving. It used to be a coverage, you know, five years ago that people were like, I don't need it. There's no benefit to it. And the prices were nominal. Now the cost of cyber insurance is going up because we're seeing breaches, you know, large breaches, small breaches, you name it. So how to protect yourself? What is the coverages that you need? Protecting yourself from a cyber or cyber crime can actually be a multi-policy or a multi-coverage solution, depending upon the type of policy that you have in place. So there's two aspects to it. There's the crime aspect, which is the direct loss of your funds. So think about some of the things Anna mentioned where your asset, your whether you're willingly giving it unbeknownst to a cyber criminal, or it's getting taken away from you directly. It's the actual asset of your business that you're losing, that financial money part of it. Um, it's first party, so that's your direct loss. And it's assets of tangible property, so it could be Bitcoin as well. So that's considered crime. And we're gonna talk a little bit about there's crime policies, there's cyber policies, and there's cyber crime policies. These policies have kind of commingled, um, you know, to kind of blur the lines between the two. So you may need both a crime, also known as an employee dishonesty policy, which originally a crime policy was meant just for that, but they've been brought in to include computer crime, funds transfer fraud, um, different aspects that can be other type of crime, not just from a direct employee, um, where a cyber policy can also have cyber crime. So there are two terminologies, not necessarily two separate policies, it's just two aspects of the coverage to keep in mind. The cyber part of it is your 
indirect losses that you can occur, which would be your data coverages, um, personal information that you can't get back. That has to be the restoration expense. Um, Anna mentioned, you know, you might not need to have forensics come in and figure out where it went. Who's paying for that? If you don't have insurance coverage to pay that forensic expense, it's an out-of-pocket expense. The bank's not going to pay for it. So the cyber portion is that indirect expenses that could come out of it, um, breach notification costs. So now you have to tell you know, your businesses, your clients that you've had a breach. Who's paying for that? Who's paying for the public relations to do damage control to your business um, or your community association? So that's the cyber portion. These are indirect expenses that can come from a breach. They usually are occurring to, they're occurring to a third party. So that crime portion's the first party, that's to you as your business. But then you have those third party expenses. You fail to protect somebody's private information and now they're mad at you. They're suing you for it. You have that liability aspect. Um, and it's data loss, data recreation. Who's gonna pay to recreate all that data that's been lost in your computer system? So those are the two main coverages that are part of cyber and cyber crime policies that I wanted to point out. Now we're gonna help you. How do you build a solution that's right for your business. It is important to look at what your exposures are. We did a cyber webinar a little over a year ago and a property manager was in the event with us and he took notes and paid attention to how much money they actually could potentially have on hand and he increased, increased his limits. And sure enough, six months later, he reached out and said, I wanna thank you for that webinar because I never realized how much money was flowing through my company that could be exposed. Um, and they did have a breach. Luckily, it wasn't to that limit that he increased it to, but just knowing he had that limit now, he could sleep better at night. Uh, so it really is important to kind of look at what your business does, what your community does, how much funds you might have on hand, and then look to build the right type of policy and coverages for you. So the building block one is going to be your liability costs. So this is, like I said, this is part of that intangible, the privacy, liability, your network security security liability. People are coming after you now. They found that you're liable for getting this, your information. You fail to protect their personal information and that's your liability. So that's one of the coverages that's part of a cyber policy is the liability end of it. So that's when someone sues you and makes a demand for you to pay them. The second building block is going to be your direct cost to your business from the security failure. So this is that crime portion I just talked about, where you actually lose those money. That's a direct cost to you. Um, the network interruption, the cyber extortion, bricking coverage, bricking, which I, uh, you know, I, I get a kick out of the name. It's when you're, for anybody that doesn't know what it is, it's when your laptop or your computer or your phone is is worth nothing more than a brick because it's been locked up. Um, so bricking coverage that data restoration from, you know, having to recreate all of that information that you had in your systems. Um, voluntary shutdown, who's going to take, you know, the in the event of a ransomware and you shut your system down, being able to recreate all that information, your reputational harm and your business income and extra expense. So now you've had a cyber crime, you can't access your computer systems, you have reputational damage and you have extra expenses that I mentioned before, part of those um, first party expenses to be able to you know, set up a new system, have IT come in and be able to recreate the data that you had on hand. Um, and then the cyber crime portion of it is that first party loss of your funds to you. Um, that's mostly what Anna was talking about with the business email compromise and the funds transfer fraud that direct somebody gets into your emails, gets that information, you hand them money, you give it to them thinking you're doing the right thing. Um, unfortunately, you're not that cash aspect. So that cyber crime, that word crime, like I said, sometimes it's included on a separate policy. Sometimes your cyber policy will include cyber crime, but there's going to be sublimits on it. So it is important to talk to your insurance professional about what you need, what your exposures are, how much money you have out there that could be compromised and making sure that your cyber crime limits are where they need to be as well as your liability limits are where they need to be. 
And then the building block three is the mitigation costs. What are those other costs that are going to be involved that you're not even thinking of? So, you know, you're getting sued, you lost your direct costs. Now, what are all those other things that you have to do? Um, the forensic costs, legal fees that you may incur, the notification and mailing services that you have to let everybody know that their email was compromised, um, credit monitoring. You might be required by a contract to provide credit monitoring if that that information that you stored was now compromised, notifying the people that lost their private information um, and now monitoring for them um, and public relations. So those expenses are mitigation costs that all of these are part of the building of a cyber policy that's right for your business or your community association. And we cannot stress enough. I know Anna stressed enough. The whole point of this webinar today was to talk about, you know, preventing fraud, what you can do, picking up that phone. You know, nobody wants to pick up the phone anymore. We're a text, email, you know, quick response, you know, society. I see Megan shaking her head. We all do it. But sometimes just that that quick phone call to say, hey, is this legitimate? If If you get that gut feeling like something might be off, Odds are it's off. And you know what? If it's not off and it's legitimate, then you get to say hi to somebody and build a little personal relationship too. Uh, but they're not going to begrudge you for double checking their funds that could potentially be going to the wrong space. So enhancing your cyber resilience, risk management is the key to doing that. The insurance has a vital role because as you can see, there's expenses that can be incurred. Um, the bank's not gonna be responsible to pay your money back. You're gonna need you know, breach notification, all of that. Um, but working together with both the insurance end of it and the risk management is really the best way to protect your businesses with the strategic risk management plan. So. Kept it kind of high level for you, but, you know, Megan will take any questions. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, yeah, so I think we covered a lot. I will open it up now um, for any questions. Let's see if I stop share. Okay. So if you guys have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A in the chat. Um, and we'll take a look and see what we get. Thank you again for joining us today. I think we're right on time here as far as having 15 minutes left to uh, to answer a couple questions. Let's see if any come in. Okay, just waiting. Anybody have any questions? Raise your um, hands, right? Yeah, you can raise your hand or you can type in the Q&A. Don't be shy, so thorough. Yeah, <laughs> don't be shy. This is a really great opportunity to ask questions that Many have experienced fraud, um, are worried about fraud. So whether it be from the insurance side or the fraud side, um, it is definitely very scary. And our goal is to provide as much prevention information as we can and keep everybody informed. Because we personally, Bank United especially, does not want um, our, we don't want our clients to fall victim. And we do everything we can here at Bank United to protect them and help them. And I did forget to mention, um, Anna said, you know, your first call should be to the bank to let them know your second, you know, call the authorities. But definitely you want to reach out to your insurance broker as well, because the cyber policies will include a lot of those expenses and they'll help you work through those situations. So when you don't know what to do, having a plan in place and definitely reach out to your broker, too, because that that policy will help. Great. And I assume, Cheryl, there's policies for the property management company, and then there's also policies available for the board, right? The individual condominiums and HOAs as well. Yes. And that's why I said it is important to kind of look at where your exposures are, what type of data you're you're holding or where any type of computer related exposures might be. You know, if you're in a high rise condominium, you may not be so worried about potential information that you have on hand, but you might be worried about somebody attacking your systems and people can't get into the buildings, they can't get into the amenities, they're locked out of their homes. It's a whole different level. So yeah. so every business, whether it's a management company, a title company, a community association is going to have some different exposure. So that's why all policies aren't created equal to you need to figure out, you know, and work with your representative what you need to be protected. Okay. Um, we do have a question from Jody. It says, what if any steps are being taken legislatively to get in front of this type of fraud? Um, so Anna, you probably know more what's happening on the government level. Legislators, oh, okay. Legislation is not getting involved when it comes to a business email compromise. What's happening, it's more of the engagement of law enforcement. 
So law enforcement, every single one, feel free to visit the FBI website, the Secret Service websites. They are they're just throwing out there as much information as possible, the Federal Trade Commission as well, as to the different types of fraud. Um, legislation is more focused on, for example, Regulation E, that's more protected of the consumer when it comes to like debit cards or ACH transactions. There's not enough legislation when it comes to commercial clients. So you're going to see more from the law enforcement side. You're going to see more from the financial institution side, um, from your insurance companies that are trying to do everything they can, but not so much from the government yeah. on the legislation side. Thanks, Anna. Um, let's see. What is being transferred? Okay. This is a question um, from Tandibi. What is Bank United's process for reviewing checks being presented to mitigate fraud? Um, so we have um, pay, positive pay is really the best product that's come out. So it used to be where it was regular positive pay. You were only verifying the check number, the check amount, you know, the check date, right? There was only a, three or four pieces that you were getting a file every day from the bank, from your accounting software or wherever you were cutting checks, right? Whether it's QuickBooks or one of your um, accounting platforms, we would get a, a, a file on a daily basis and all the checks that would come in for clearing would get that, you know, compared up against that file. Anything that didn't match that file goes out to a web reject, I guess, as we call it, right? There's a there's a limited time during the day to say, yes, I did a handwritten check and handed it to a vendor. That check is okay. And you'll get a copy of that image. Um, and now what we've added in the last few years, which has been a game changer for us because people have been stealing checks out of the mail and washing the payees, right? So the old pay, you know, positive pay, it's the check number match, the amount, the date, everything looked good, but they washed the check and made it payable to John Smith instead of JR's contracting, right? And they cashed that check. Um, and so pay, positive pay is sort of that closing the gap, right? The only exposure we have there is, is forged endorsement, right? So if the check was, but that's usually on the depositing bank, right? To prove that they did their due diligence and that the check was deposited in the name of an account, right? And so there's a little bit of leverage there, but um, essentially pay positive pay is the best way to protect your accounts. It's going to compare the pay name, the dollar amount, the date, the check number, and it's going to come from a file from your system. And you'll also have the ability to, um, decision checks online. So if you place a stop payment, or, you know, again, if you did a manual check, you'll be able to see the front and back of the check and say, yes, that check is okay. Or no, it's fraud. And you return it before it even hits post to your account, which is incredible, right? Then we don't have to go through all of these steps. Um, so that's definitely what Bank United is doing. And then obviously we're, you know, as Anna said, our goal is really to educate as many clients as possible on, you know, even when you send out those checks, even if they're good checks, right? Did you do a callback to that vendor? Is that the right address? Is that the right phone number that you're used to calling? If you look on their website versus what's in an email, which could have been hacked. I think we rely way too much on email instead of picking up the phone or looking online to public information to say that phone number doesn't even make sense, right? That's not the vendor's phone number. Um, so that would be my suggestion. Uh, we have one other question. Um, this one will be for Cheryl. It says, do you have recommendations on coverage amounts for insurance? Can you ballpark what the three blocks may cost you on average? Obviously, that might be a follow-up question. Yeah, you know, because it is going to depend. Um, you know, there are small policies for a community association that are going to give you your basic, you know, cyber crime, the privacy breach liability, and they can be, you know, five or six hundred dollars. Um, then you have broader policies with higher limits that can be a couple thousand dollars. Okay. All right. I think that's all the questions. Um Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Anna, for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Um, we welcome any feedback and obviously you'll have myself and Cheryl's information to follow up. I'll certainly funnel things to Anna um, as needed for questions on her end. But thank you again for joining us. Hope everyone has a wonderful day and we'll follow up tomorrow with the materials. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.